That's Sean. Shane, sorry. Who's that? Uh, Shane uh, from Warner Podcast, is it? Yeah, I believe mm-hmm. so. Well, yes, hello. sir. Hello, Shane. <laughs> we got the crew together. Yeah, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty damn good crew. <laughs> so joining us today, uh, Smuggler. Uh, how are you doing, my friend? I'm uh, doing fine. Yes. How are you? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm really surprised. 58 hours non-stop live stream, but I'm barely doing any work. <laughs> Everyone else is doing uh, it's awesome shows. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's it's actually quite a, a quite a nice congress. A fam- very familiar, uh, a bit smaller. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but I think that's that's kind of good actually. Well, you have time for people. That is really you see, cool. you know, you it's, see? It's, it's less stress. You know, it's more like hang out, take it easy. You know, I mean, I actually slept almost eight hours. Wow, that I mean, is that never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that is true. That's true. Well, what was your after party? No after party. None. No. At I, all. No, I actually no. went back to the hotel and took a long hot shower and went to bed at two, I think. So I Oh mean, that's I, just ridiculous. I, I know. I, I think <laughs> I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> yes, or boring. And, and boring. And both, <laughs> yes, yes. I didn't uh, even have alcohol. Oh, I mean, I know. that's the other thing. I have to fix that tonight. Uh, for sure, for sure. Uh, so, so there will be something happening. Uh, we I hope so, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Nico, how are you doing uh, on, on the other side? How are you enjoying Congress so far? Are you watching any of it? Yeah, I've been watching most of it, but it's just impossible to keep up with all of it. So much interesting content, but luckily there's always time to go back and review 1.5 uh, speed up. So get up to speed, but really good stuff. Everything I've heard so far, uh, really inspiring and also a great chance to uh, participate in the conversation with with you guys. Really appreciate it. Yes, yes. Sean, how about you? How's it going with the Wanda podcast? What's new for you? Hey, hey, uh, yeah, doing well. I'm certainly, uh, certainly happy to be here with you guys. Uh, Smuggler, good to be chatting with you again. Uh, Maxia, yeah, obviously, uh, good to be, good to be chatting with you. Um, but uh, yeah, Bonnie podcast. Uh, um, what's new? I mean, uh, we're we're still continuing uh, our health liberation, self liberation series. Uh, so helping to free our listeners, uh, our audience from uh, the fascist coercion of big pharma. Um, and, um, yeah, beyond that, so we've got a lot of, uh, we, uh, I just, re- we just released, uh, our building the second realm series, uh, on the Vani podcast feed. So that's edited down a little bit, which I would highly, highly recommend. Um, that's, uh, one of the most important, uh, one, one of the most important series I put out. Um, and, uh, obviously inspired by, uh, by smugglers book, a uh, second round book on strategy. So, um, yeah, that's kind of, uh, kind of, uh, our focus over there right now. And, um, that's what I'm doing here on my 22 acre homestead. So a lot of that content uh, will be, uh, interspersed as well. Uh, trying to, uh, to build up a little intentional community here. So I'm um, trying to go off grid. So that's, that's what I'm working on here. Very cool. Very, very good. Um, so smuggler, uh, actually, wh- when did you discover Vanu? Uh, I'm, I'm curious because it is so much aligned with, uh, I never did. Never. No, Shane was the dude that reached out to me. Incredible. So I had no idea. I had never heard about it before, whatever. And then Shane, I think he just emailed me and said, hey, I'd like to, I don't even know what he wanted. Like, <laughs> have a podcast. Or, I don't know. And then he talked about this yeah. and stuff. And I was like, wow. <laughs> How did that escape me? <laughs> so. Uh, no, uh, all credit goes to Shane when it comes to me and uh, knowing about Bono. Yes, incredible. <laughs> but the, you know, the funny thing is because I discovered uh, Shane and the Bono podcast through that interview. Um, and it's I called think networking. Ma- many people, <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> so, Sean, uh, how yeah. was that? why did you reach out to Smuggler? Um, why did I reach out to Smuggler? Well, I, I think I I'd, I'd... I, I pro- I'm pretty sure um, it was just in regards to the second realm, uh, uh, second realm content. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I I just at that time probably been, gone through all the content I possibly could on Interplex within the span of like two or three days, and uh, was uh, yeah really 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 into the content. 
Um, and, uh, you know, me coming across Vani was much like, and, and, and you, I guess you not hearing about Vani was much like um, a lot of people with, uh, with the Second Realm before I did that building the Second Realm series. It was just this gem that was just hidden on this website um, that a lot of people really hadn't heard about. And same with Vani. It was this, this book that was on, on Amazon for like $30. And, you know, I never really spent that much on books. And I was like, you know, um, had no idea what, what to expect. So it was just kind of kind of one of those things that uh, stumbled across it. So um, yeah, I think they, they did. there's definitely a very, very synergistic connection there. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm still actually quite surprised at that um, there, there was such a long time of like the system not being developed outside of the, the writings of Rayo, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. pretty much it's been a brand right. for, for a long time until the Vano podcast and the work that you've been doing. What, why is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it was just it was really, really small then. I mean, uh, um, there's a very, very much a security culture minded group, um, even back in back in those days, uh, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. And, uh, you know, they, they kind of corresponded in these these small, uh, you know, libertarian, uh, you know, alternative uh, magazines. And it just it really wasn't that big. Uh, so when Rayo disappeared in 1974, and uh, when I guess, the, the the publications kind of kind of died out or slowed down um it just kind of kind of got lost uh, until 1983 when when john fisher um with, which is uh, the pseudonym of jim stum uh, um who I, I actually interviewed he actually met rayo back in the 1970s but uh yeah he uh i guess put put together a, a collection of uh, articles by rayo and released it and that's uh the only reason why i came across it was because he decided 11 years i guess uh, you know nine years later to put that out uh so i came across it and was so Profound. I, I can't. I was, it was so profound. So I, I recorded an audiobook for it, uh, digitized it. So the the book and the and the audiobook are available for free uh, on the Vani Podcast website. And I would highly highly recommend people check it out. Um, it's just really really incredible stuff from the sixties and seventies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, really. I was, I was very astonished uh, because it's just so much to the point. Uh, it's, 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 it's very, very, very great strategy, but, but maybe to, to start out with, uh, or, or to come back to an actual definition, um, it's not there, or how would you cl categorize, uh, clarify the strategy of one? Uh, that's really hard because I'm not that deep into one. That's why I'm asking you though. Yeah. So, <laughs> so then uh, you can deepen that knowledge. I think that the. The two things that I would put in the forefront is um, security culture and mobility. But also mm -hmm. it is relatively individualistic. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the sense not that it's about individuals only, but it's also that it's very little coordination between uh, individuals. So it's really one person doing one thing. So and that, that is a little, a little bit like where Second Realm is different because Second Realm is a little bit more about groups of individuals than about isolated individuals. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, that's true. Yeah. It's more about uh, self-sufficiency, maybe. Yeah. yeah. What do you think, Shay? Yeah. Yeah, I would uh, I would certainly agree. I mean, those are the yeah the two the probably the two most important uh, and most relevant um, aspects of Vanu is the security culture and the mobility. Um, it's something Rayo talked about in the 1960s, and that's why he was a van nomad. That's why um, whenever uh, he uh, got sick of the the slave tags, the driver's licensure, and those sorts of things, he uh, he went uh, really radical with it and uh, yeah pursued wilderness Vanu um, and uh, will, yeah just lived in lived in a, a national forest in uh, Northern California, Southern Oregon, and uh, just moved around a lot. Uh, so that mobility is uh, really what provides a, a lot of that invulnerability of coercion. Because uh, as I've said so many times, if the coercers can't find you, they can't coerce you. Uh, so yeah, um, I, yeah, Fred, yeah, that's those definitely the two most important aspects of Anu, in my opinion. Yeah. Nico, what do you think so far? Well, you know, I think uh, we should move towards thinking like a morally like I, th I feel like there's a lot of even today and yesterday there was a lot of talk about good and evil of things and right and wrong of things is it is it right to uh for people to do certain things and i think um if we think logically and individually what is good for us and we think a morally instead of trying to find a higher moral ground in in respect of other people uh, in, in respect to other people I think we can reach much better results and that would naturally drive into smaller 
um, kind of like gangs almost rather than tribes. And, you know, it's basically what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but this is something that I, I like about well, both uh, cypherpunk strategies as well as wellness strategies, um, that they're very applied. Right? They actually are designed to accomplish a result. Um, and it's not, of, of course, the, 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 let's say, ethical concern is, is a part of it, but that morality aspect is a part of it that, that can be used in, in argumenting for or against the strategy. But fundamentally, it doesn't matter. Right? The, the, the actions taken and the results from them um, are, are there. I actually disagree. I think that a lot of those strategies work because they're moral. I mean, there's always this thing that we, um, we, we are always at, at risk to take over the moral thinking of the post society or the slave drivers or whatever. And I think that what really gives you strength, both as an individual and as a small group, be it a gang, be it a tribe, or whatever, is to actually embrace your own morality. It's not amoral, it is actually, it's more like a metamoral approach, where you actually look at why is it good to be free, why is it good, how to interact with each other, etc. So, we actually, I would actually consider a lot of our things to be much more moral and justified moral than the slave society. Very yeah, much. I like that. I like that distinction. Like personal standards, I, I would call them. Like uh, everybody should kind of grow their own backbone and their own opinions yeah. and wield their like in the information war wield their own uh, personality and social media accounts as the weapons and fight for themselves and, and you know have their own opinions and standards and enforce those and instead of having these elaborate really you know legal structures you should, you could have much simple moral structure with with this kind of like agreed upon moral guidelines which for me the most fundamental is do not steal which which covers uh, quite a bit actually under it almost all the violence um so i think we are in many ways living in the world which is corrupt morally and financially in every which way so it's it's not conceivable to people that this would be a better way to do things rather we are just kind of like hanging hanging on and and trying to leech off as much as possible and you know like this kind of rent seeking uh, society and this is thought that it's it's okay this it's the proper thing to do but it, it causes cognitive dis dissonance because it's not really um, really natural and it's not really often it's based on coercion and not voluntarism which uh, every transaction by nature should be mm -hmm. mm. i do think that yeah those are interesting interesting points and uh, one of the things that just reminds me about the second realm book uh, that was right really well said uh, in my opinion that is related to this i mean our different type of morals like not the ones that the mainstream media uses or mainstream itself and uh, that might even make us like outlaws in some people's opinions and this little quote that i found from the second realm book that while we are on the other hand outlaws we are not low lives we are cheerful colorful and also serious and realistic outlaws i mean that in my opinion was just really well put yeah. and yeah. i do definitely recommend people to check out the second realm book it's like a must read for everyone who's interested in uh, getting out of the system and you know maybe founding some kind of a citadel and in general just about freedom yeah. and i will definitely be checking out one i haven't heard about it before I think what shouldn't be underestimated is how much morals and ethics and rules you actually need to have an effective gang or crew or tribe or whatever. Um, but one of the, the big things there is that no matter what you have, 
in your organization. It's always a voluntary thing. You step into it and you subscribe to it, or you step out of it because you don't like it. So the, I, I think that, I mean, at least we underestimated how much we actually had to think about things and codify things to be um, effective and stable. So that, that is really a thing. So the, the moment you're operating with a group of people, there are actually quite a lot of things. You have to invent when it comes to organization, decision making, uh, how to position yourself against each other, etc. So that shouldn't be underestimated. I mean, it's, it's something that we're still learning um, and where we clearly see that we made mistakes in the beginning, for example, so we could think about certain things. This is actually the point where I think that, that second column and Vanu crashes or, or diverges, right? Because I think Rayo realized that fact that it's just so tricky, so difficult to have this interaction, this, this social interaction, and in many cases it will go wrong, right? So in order to just avoid that whole chaos and that potential to an harassment, um, escape to a more self-sufficient uh, route without relying on that uh, social cooperation um, and the benefits and the, the, the uh, downsides that division of labor has. Yeah, I think that one has this, actually this aspect that you have problems with the division of labor. And so we're coming in from a perspective of escaping is not everything you do, because escaping only works to a certain degree, and it actually works less and less in our surveillance state. So you actually need this ability to uh, conceal stuff and to defend stuff, and there you actually need people. It's something that you cannot do alone. You know, it's like this. Uh, why do guys have gangs? You know, because you have to sleep, and somebody else has to stand guard for you. You know, but that simple aspect of you cannot be awake twenty four seven is what what requires you to to build networks of high trust that have common interests, and that immediately goes into. So, how do we organize that? So it's not, I wouldn't call it complicated in a sense, you know, it's, uh, okay, it, it kind of depends, you know, if you're a software programmer, complexity is something you deal with. So maybe I don't find it that complicated, but um, it's it's something that, that has to be learned and has to be embraced. And I think it is, it is especially hard because we're so used to just taking all that for granted that they're coming from an extreme. You know, and really like developing a mind for how do you become effective cooperators? How do you become an effective team, essentially? That, that is uh, something that most of us never had to deal with. Hmm. So, yeah, I guess I guess I could I could offer real quick just that, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, like it, it is it is really simple when you think about it, right? I mean, Rayo talked about back in the he wrote an article back in the 1960s, uh, just titled along the lines of uh, the ethical principle of non-coercion, before the non-aggression principle was was coined. And when you think about it, like it's you know going back to you know ancient times, like the golden rule, like these sorts of things are are foundational in a lot of in, in a lot of these um, a lot of these uh, a lot of these religions. Um, it really is easy when like it's it's very simple when you think about it. But um, then the 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 theoretically when you think about it. But then yeah, when when you get people together, um, there's always conflict. And then when, whenever you think about uh, the first realm um, in this as well, um, and and uh, and uh, the, the, that major threat of coercion, um, especially with uh, with fixed properties. If you're talking about permanent autonomous zones, um, I mean yeah, it's uh, it can get complicated. And uh, if someone if if uh, mistakes are made or if there's disagreements, uh, you know, bad things could happen. So um, I, I think that's uh, that's that's worth worthy worthy of pointing out. So that it, it is it, it does it is fairly it is fairly simple. But then when you get people together, um, disagreements always arise. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. Practical implementation is where it gets complicated. The theory is trivial. The practical implementation requires effort. You know, and 
the interesting thing with the effort is you actually have to be strong in your your moral perspective mm -hmm. to actually have the the backdrop and the energy to to actually come to a conclusion on how to organize it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But the, the first principles are important, right? and that aspect. But they have to be shared. You know. Oh, so you important. have to share them. I mean, it's more than just the first principles. Also, this sharing a vision on what you are working on. Mm -hmm. You know. So, this uh, all we all want to be free is too much of a vision to actually agree on. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's it's in a way with too little content. So drilling it down and say, okay, what are we going to specialize on? How do we going to run things? Whatever. That's really important, and uh, it's it requires individual thought every time you do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, absolutely. Um, so we mentioned all several times that this aspect of mobility, that it is an. an important uh, consideration uh, for, for usage uh, because it's it's basically a solution to many of the problems that we spoke about right that there is this potential of conflict with multiple individuals so what to do about that right um, and uh, so why is the mobility aspect um, important well you can escape a conflict before it ex escalates that is a, a fundamental thing with being mobile is when you're coming into a situation or you are in a situation where conflict arises you have the choice of either continuing to escalate it or um, escape it in the sense of pulling the plug and going somewhere else. Because usually, and I say usually because that's not always true, usually your opponent is not as mobile or not interested in you specifically, but only in his own territory of you know, jurisdiction, neighborhood, or whatever. So uh, mobility allows you to to get rid of a lot of um, conflict escalation potential. And that makes it a, a winning strategy uh, often. Because there are a lot of conflicts that we cannot escalate. You know, we would fail. So it's really important to, to figure out how to get out of the conflict without being uh, subverted. Yes. Uh, and now, now the interesting question is about the. So, for sure, we want to be mobile, but how fast do we want to be mobile, and to what extent should that mobility go? Um, and here, we two have been having a conversation, uh, actually, while standing in test zero, uh, about exactly that. So, shipping containers are very mobile, but will you put wheels on the shipping containers? Basically, do you have a, a truck, uh, fundamentally, then that is highly, highly mobile, with that you can move? centimeters however you want for a very very cheap price uh, or do you opt for something like a shipping container that is stationary on the ground uh, that can only be moved with a crane and one additional truck um, so what, what what is your reasoning here? Um, it's a trade-off like everything so um, shipping containers are portable they're not mobile mm -hmm. they're portable but they have aspects like they're relatively cheap compared to a truck. They can be stacked compared to trucks. I mean, stacking trucks is usually an accident. <laughs> um, so the, the, the question really is, how do you deal with conflicts? What conflicts do you expect and with whom? And there are some uh, conflict parties that escalate very, very quickly. And their mobility plays a big role. And then there are conflict parties that escalate slowly, so they have more of a warning time. And then you can still move out before the, the, the problem is, is uh, you know, taking over. So it's a trade-off, and it has a lot to do with what you expect the, the conflict party to be, mm -hmm. and how you can deal with, uh, with it. So the, an example of a slowly escalating uh, conflict party, that's actually the state. Because the state operates within a relatively complex organization that requires internal rules and processes. Those rules and processes require time. And uh, it has quite significant costs for every um, escalation step it takes. It is actually not cheap to, to send a couple of policemen to, to deal with the TAZ. It is actually not cheap because it takes time. 
they have to write reports about it. There are actually people that are usually not in any kind interested in, in doing the job, or at least not that specific job. So um, there's a certain cost uh, connected to that. And that cost, that complexity gives you a certain delay between escalation steps. And that delay is often weeks or months. So and we basically need 24 hours to move, you know, or 48 in the maximum. And it can move everywhere relatively quickly without a trace, etc. And that is another thing. Shipping containers are relatively traceless. So um, they don't uh, show up on automatic license plate recognition. They don't uh, show up in, you know, when you're leaving, you're not leaving behind what your container number is or whatever. And you know? also um, when the conflict party comes back, there's actually nothing to go on because you can't, you know, go online and look for the container number and say, where did it go? So they're, they're relatively traceless, but um, there are also parties that are uh, fast escalating. And fast escalating parties are uh, people like criminals. Mm -hmm. So criminal groups are uh, much quicker in escalation. They can react much faster because they have um, a much stronger hierarchy and they have much higher self-interest in their activities. Which means that if your opponent is like a motorcycle gang, for example, then the escalation steps are usually hours, you know, not days. The problem is with a lot of those criminal uh, groups is that they have an inherent self-interest and personal interest. So it's always personal for them, which means that they have actually no problem in tracking you down no matter where you go. And their this ability to have defensible infrastructure, have multiple people together, be hard to trace, etc., is is really important. Mm -hmm. So, and those are the kinds of conflicts that you usually want to escalate, as as bad as it sounds. But the reality is that the state is not our only enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, the the reality is that the world is full of people that are thieves. You know, that's it. You know, it's, it's, it's the reality. So not wanting to be stolen from doesn't mean that you have to deal with the state only, but everybody else. And at least from our perspective, our problems so far have only been with non-state actors. Nobody else. Can the I, state uh, never, never was a big issue for us. Uh, g'day, fellas. Uh, sitting on the couch there, how are you? Uh, I just wanted to add, um, in in the uh, in the nineties, my brother uh, had uh, lived in a squat in Kupernicker Straße in Berlin, and uh, this was after you know after the wall fell down. There was all these just empty buildings, and uh, yeah, like you said, it was sometimes neo Nazis wanted to rush the place to sort of beat yeah. people up, and sometimes police would want to. So it was kind of they they had these much different actors or constantly sort of threatening and um and they had all sorts of things like trap doors uh, weighed down by uh weighed down by old uh, uh boots and stuff like that uh you know um and 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 all sorts of little things that they could quickly go boom 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 and trap doors would come down and you know these were old buildings old fabric uh old uh, factories and stuff so uh, they, that was a, it was quite an amazing thing to see. I mean, I was very young back then, and my brother was you know, in, in his te late teens. But uh, that was an interesting time, and it was uh, it was sort of the the predecessor for me when when, I, when I'm listening to you talking, as well. It, yeah, it's not as it's not as mobile, but he could definitely pack up his backpack and just leave uh, because yeah, it was a squad. Yeah. 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 Well, the difference is uh, how much of your capital do you want to leave behind? how much uh, potential for, for conflict do you want to have with just the, the place you're in. Mm -hmm. So squatting initially uh, um, attracts a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's much uh, less conflict if you have your own stuff, mm -hmm. you know, because you're not perceived as a, yeah. as a thief, you know. So it's one less party you have to deal with, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. but, but 
the, the lesson there is, is a similar one, you know. So squatters have to deal with a broad spectrum of potential opponents. And TSEs have to deal with a broad spectrum of opponents. And um, bad moments have a broad spectrum of opponents. So the question is, what is your threat model? Yes. And in, in the threat model, I personally think that the group of people being cooperating uh, with the defensible infrastructure and then being able to move if the attacker gets big, that is like the sweet spot for me at least. Mm -hmm. So, but it really depends on where you are, what you do, you know, what do you do in, in your place? You know, if you're a van nomad, there's not actually anything but you happening in that space. You know, you're not having any events or you're not trading there or whatever. But for TSE, for example, it's a semi-social space where you actually want to have outsiders come in mm -hmm. and interact with them and have market interactions and social interactions and trade and whatever. So the the, the range of uh, use cases is bigger, which also means that your attackers are more complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and again, it's it's, uh, it's about trade-offs and, and different exactly. uh, attack vectors and threat modelings, exactly. right? and and whom are you defending against? Exactly. Um, and uh, also the, that shift in between the strategies, because uh, for example, some strategies are going to bring you smaller encounters of harassment more yeah. frequently, yeah. Uh, but protect you against larger encounters of harassment yeah. on the long term. Um, and that's that's a that's an interesting trade-off to consider as well. Yeah. Um, and Rayo has one very important metric: um, the mean time to harassment. Right. So um, you're you're being uh, encountered by the police uh, today, and then in five weeks later, uh, you are going to be back, uh, or like the, the um, you're harassed again by the border control, for example. So these two weeks is the mean time to harassment, and the goal is to increase this. Uh, so a question for uh, Sean would be. Uh, does th this metric actually include the severity of harassment as well? Um, does it include the severity of the harassment? Um, I guess. Uh, I guess it, it, it. I guess it depends on the scale because uh, um, the way that the way that Rayo um, referred to it in his book, and he only he only referenced uh, meantime harassment a couple times in his writings. Um, but he he talked about like uh, I guess more like uh, so there's. Uh, low activity versus high activity so low activity would be like wilderness fauna um high activity would be like a hidden a hidden workshop with small manufacturing for example so um i guess it, it, it the i guess the so he might he might have been more referring to capital losses like if you if a small manufacturing plant is raided and the equipment gets stolen um versus if you have to leave uh leave an axe behind in the woods or something something along those lines um but i, I did want to mention one thing um because uh smuggler pointed out something really 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 good and and um but yeah, Vanu distinguishes uh, like the who who are who are the coercers. Well, Vanu distinguishes distinguishes this as public versus private coercion. And I've said this a lot on the podcast that even if the state were to disappear tomorrow, Vanu would still be necessary because there will always be private coercers. Um, so um, yeah, there will always be a need for strategies to make ones to make make it uh, to make an individual more invulnerable to coercion. Um, but yeah, in terms of meantime to harass me, I think he he really he really only referred to it in scale, but um, and, and and sort of this the scale of the operation, but. Um, yeah, I think that's 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 another important element to to look at too. Because if if you're thinking about you know like a someone who lives on a sailboat, if they have like three or four interactions a year, like they're like every time they go to port, um, yeah, every time they go to port, they have to interact with like five different governmental agencies. So like that's they may have a like a, a very you know long me time harassment where the the harassment's like you know months in between, but when they deal with the coercion, they deal with a lot of coercion at one time. So. Um, yeah, there's certainly a lot of considerations. Yes, um, and and one additional question, right? As we as we said that uh, there are different types of uh, or or qualities of mobility. Right, a container is already very portable, but a container on wheels is much more portable. Um, and Rail had a, a switch, uh, or he he started out as as van nomadism was was one of his earlier strategies, and then eventually moved. Uh, to an even uh, more nomadic lifestyle in the wilderness. Uh, Sean, where, where do you think is, is this uh, this year relevant? Um, 
Sorry, can you can you uh, so you said why um, why is it relevant that he went from the van nomadism to kind of the more the wilderness fauna? Is that, in, uh, in the context of, of a similar of, area that that you have different types uh, of mobility and different frequencies. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, uh, uh, so in terms of the harassment, I mean, uh, uh, Rayo, I, I guess Rayo talked about uh, in, in terms of um, the wilderness fauna versus van nomadism. I guess his 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 main interaction with for for either would be with with forest bludge, as, as he called it, um, forest bludge, or if uh, or just random random hikers. Um, but but either way, um, I mean, I, I feel like the, the wilderness Vani strategy he pursued, he, it was just a lot easier for him to blend in because if he came across anybody, um, he could just say that he was hiking through the woods. Um, but um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that was. I, I'm not sure if I understood your question completely. So hopefully, hopefully that provided some sort of an answer. Could I could I ask a question? I, uh, I'm six foot, almost six foot nine. <laughs> Us giants <laughs> out there uh, can't live in containers. Can barely live on a boat. <laughs> Uh, what options do giants have? I'm uh, 190 myself, and I cannot reach the ceiling of the container with my hands if I want to. Oh, nice. So I, 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 oh. <laughs> no, seriously, it's yes. like, uh, they're like um, high cube containers, and uh -huh. you have uh, you cannot be as big as you, as you would have to be to scratch your head on, on a container wall. Oh, good. good to be exact. So containers are not small. Containers are actually yes. uh, quite uh, impressive. You know, like a, a lot of people just know containers from afar or from TV or whatever. It's a big box. But if you if you actually have one and and you open the door and you step in, you you actually kind of. Yeah, what the shit am I going to do with the space now? <laughs> so, and I can have so many rooms in here. Wow. Well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, they what? are not small. They're not cramped. They're actually quite quite impressive. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and again, this is this also again depends on what's chosen because uh, you know for something like uh, like a big truck, even the decent truck uh, yeah. is uh, I mean it's a big vehicle, uh, and the and the box inside is is decently large. But even here, the height is, I think, uh, I think it's something 195 or yeah, something, right? It's under two yeah, meters. Yeah. Um, and, and with the length of the width, it's, it's not too much. So, it, like, this is a very large, very movable uh, vehicle where it's already a bit difficult, right? So, if it's not a shipping container, but more of a, like a, a, a fixed box truck, yeah. right? That's already one thing. Uh, and you can, of course, go even smaller, you know, maybe three and a half ton trucks, uh, or then vans, actual vans are, are a much, much smaller. Uh, and there you will really have an issue with standing. Um, there are not many like sprinter van types that are 190 or 195 yeah. tall, mm. um, and, and very odd to get them. Uh, so it's this, this is for sure a concern, right? And for tall people, this is what was one of my requirements for my dwelling place. Like I'm, I'm not going to constantly bow down my head yeah. in my dwelling place. It's no, that's I think bad for my <laughs> for my mental psyche. <laughs> yeah. um, so this this was very important. So good question, John. Nico wanted to ask something. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. You know, I, I love container housing, and I I was developing this kind of like parasite modular container housing uh, concept back in the day when I was doing my thesis. And ever since, you know, I've been always thinking like it would be a cool thing to do. And it, yeah, it's it's really need to see that people are finding that as well the containers are great because you have the infrastructure to move those like you can yeah. stay mobile like they're i mean they're in no means mobile but they're portable like like smuggler yeah. said um but that's that's probably enough because like i'm i classify myself as a nomad for the past 10 years i've i haven't uh stayed in a single location for more than a year so for me that's uh like living the nomadic lifestyle so in that kind of uh, um, time frame container housing is, uh, is nearly perfect and you can also tweak it just just for the climate where you're going and yeah. you can add panels and it can be quite quite self-sufficient and you can also opt to this kind of like parasitic model where you actually agree with the host building uh to you yeah. know couple into their system it's probably not no extra strain on them but they can make a little bit extra money on that since yeah. you're your uh, parking there so 
a lot of options there really like that and and another thing is also like these uh, energy cubes which are now quite popular and with bitcoin mining as well uh, really really great uh, tool to use in the current infrastructure at least Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, maybe let's let's think a bit more on that design of actual houses, uh, because as you said, with multiple containers, you can do quite some interesting things, yeah. right? So, so one area that is very heavily mentioned in Second Home is access control. Yeah, super critical. Yeah, right. Uh, so, critical. yes, yes. So, um, maybe first of all, why it's important, and second, how do you use containers to manifest access control already? Okay. So, why is it important? Um, the second round strategy is about building places, both physical and virtual, that have an in and an out. So they're insulated against the outside and isolated. Uh, the outside is isolated from them. And that is um, to create this, this space where your own rules can actually apply. So if you don't bring problems to the outside, the outside doesn't notice you or doesn't have an incentive. To, to deal with you, and even if it wants to deal with you, it becomes harder to do that. So, what you kind of want in a TAZ, for example, you want the place to always exist and always be accessible to the right people. So, and that is where access control comes in. And there are two aspects to access control. Um, aspect number one is to select who can pan it, and uh, question number two is how many. So, and the how many is really important. So, especially when you're talking about uh, anonymous guests, um, if there are whatever, suddenly 20 people showing up and want to enter the space at the same time, that's a takeover attempt, you know? That's like police coming in and whatever. But if it's like one guest coming per hour, you know, and then another guest leaving, whatever, then you have a, a certain control over the space. And to enable that, um, access control is important. And the other thing is that access control dis, um, serves as a delay. So the the access control barrier allows you to know a little bit better when you're attacked and introduces a delay in which you can um, minimize the damage of the attack. And that is why access control is dramatically important. So how do you do that? Well, one thing is that containers, um, especially if you outfit them correctly, can serve as very sturdy walls. Mm -hmm. So like a, a, uh, a bare container is something that you cannot go through without specialized tools, mm -hmm. but it takes some time. And, and it's loud. And, and it's noticeable. loud, you notice it, exactly. And especially when they're outfitted, it's actually really hard to get to them because you need multiple levels of tools and multiple staff, whatever. So they're actually really good walls in a certain degree. And do, if you have a TSE made out of containers, you basically take a wall with you. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like uh, integrated. And even if you're talking about extremely hostile environments, like um, military forts, you often build them out of containers and then just put uh, earth into the containers and then you actually have uh, protection against mortars and gunfire and everything. So you can actually build buckets out of containers quite easily. That's interesting. And um, the, the next thing that you basically need is, um, and we're still working on the details of how to, what's the best way of actually building that, is um, right now we're, we're working with a bouncer, you know? So all our events have a bouncer, basically. Uh, most of them, that's me. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, that's not the ideal thing you really want. What you want is automatic access control. That is actually what you want to have. Replace you with robot. Replace me with a robot, <laughs> exactly. So, um, and what you need there is a system of um, anonymous untraceable identification on the one hand, and you need uh, something that is called a map trap, which is basically uh, a way that you can count how many people come through, and you can uh, 
you can control the people, uh, the, the movement of people in and out to be only individuals, basically, and then be able to say, okay, no more people in or no more people out mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something that our plans currently are for a 10-foot container. That's not ideal, but it's the cheap way with uh, a subway cross inside. So the same thing you know from a subway, or at least a lot of subways, these big crosses that are like nine high um, and that uh, connected to some software that we're still meditating about. <laughs> Same thing at this point. So it's that yeah. early. <laughs> yeah, well, well they have been prototypes and everything, but it's it's really important to to be careful that this thing doesn't turn against you. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, access control needs to give you the control without leaving traces that can be used yes. against you. Yes. And that is. Not that trivial, actually, to to design, including stuff like being able to exclude people that um, have caused trouble or whatever, yeah. without making it a tracing machine. Yes, you know, yes. so it's it's actually it's quite an interesting uh, problem. Yeah, this was this is actually such a difficult like challenge that we saw. How to get um, a strong reputation in a strong privacy? Right? Yes. Um, this is this is very very difficult. It's probably impossible. The, the only thing that I can come up with are trusted third parties, arbitrators, basically. Uh, but but that is I mean that is that is a possible solution. Yeah. But yeah. Trusted third parties. It has certain bad failure modes. Yeah. So um, exactly. it, it's uh, a big question if you want those failure modes in a critical aspect of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I just wanted to point out uh, another option for these containers that was in the Second Realm book uh, that is not as maybe good for access restriction uh, type of things or hiding, but for example, the club on the 20th floor or just having a house uh, high up in a, like, a, yeah, high up uh, in a big building. Uh, so it takes time to actually come all the way up there so you would have some kind of a time window that you would get alerted about this like attacker or some someone who comes into the the main entrance and yeah. that some kind of alarm or something like that so you can know that if you haven't invited anyone you can start acting and you know whatever you need to do or maybe even you can design a certain like a secret exit yeah, I mean this this club it actually still exists, huh. and um, they have enormously great access control. I mean they have bouncers that I am scared of, but they're yeah. relatively friendly. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, they they actually made this thing or this decision to be able to risk their property, so they cannot escalate conflict forever because. Their property cannot be removed, so they risk all their capital in that in their property. But um, the the location, the design, the processes, etc., make it extremely um, easy to defend. So, and I only know of I think two raids there ever, and they have never re recovered anything. Mm -hmm. So. It's I one thing I'd like to ask is what sort of what does society look like where this becomes a um, something that's actually needed by people um, apart from you know the prepper I hate to use that term prepper type of people that are preparing for something um, what, what does society look like is it a hardcore sort of police state is it Germany 33 uh, like, where what, what does it look like if I may say, I would say that uh, we are currently already needing these kind of things. Uh, it just, you know, depends on yeah, how do you want to see the situation. Mm -hmm. But, we, uh, well, some people would need these kind of things if they have different type of morals than whatever our, the society is currently pushing on us. So 
I, I don't think that this is like a futuristic thing or that everybody would be in this situation or even want this. You know, I think most of the people will always just trust the third, par uh, third parties and uh, yeah, they don't want liberty as much as uh, this certain type of like safety. Yeah. I, I, I must, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I must get in because Floor is going to kill me uh, if, if I don't. So uh, sorry, but I got to go. I have a workshop uh, to also about Bitcoin privacy on the main stage. So thank you very much for this good conversation. Please continue it for a couple more minutes uh, and next shows will come on uh, at the full time uh, of the hour. So uh, okay. continue the great talk and see you all uh, later. All right, Max. Ciao. Uh, I would actually like to, to answer the question. Uh, yeah. So when is it required? It is uh, required as soon as you don't have an externalized uh, security force. So the moment you, you don't have an external security force that fights for you, you need a society that is able to defend itself uh, on a lower level. Mm. And, um, how does such a society then look like? And my example for that is uh, the Renaissance in Italy. Uh, so, if, if you know Italian architecture a little bit, a little bit, walk yeah. around in Rome and Florence and whatever, you will uh, discover that a lot of the older buildings are actually built for defense. First, uh, windows is very high. Um, the uh, doors themselves uh, are often uh, easily defendable and they're set in to the, to the place. And they usually have courtyards in the, uh, on the inside. So these houses are basically little defendable communities um, that can deal with, you know, robbers coming by in the middle of the night or police coming by or whatever. So uh, the, these places, uh, so when you look at the architecture, all these places are actually little autonomous zones that are uh, defensible. And I think that the no matter what we do, uh, police state, uh, no police anymore, whatever, we need defensible if, if, um, infrastructure and architecture. Yeah, I mean, you see this also in places like the Philippines and, and stuff where there's small communities and they all pay private police uh, or security guards to take care of a certain region. And because of that, the security, uh, depending on, of course, the wealth uh, gap or, or whatever, um, but even non-wealthy people generally have, they pay, the part of the rent is to pay the, the cop that walks up and down and sleeps most of the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it it it's really interesting. I, I, you know, having a young family, what sort of, um, what sort of, does this lifestyle fit uh, for someone who has, you know, a one year old, um, a, a a life partner, and uh, is is also, you know, trying to make life happen, working, <laughs> and stuff like that, or is this? Do you find that mostly it's uh, it, it's it's a much easier lifestyle if it, if you're just a couple or a single person? I would think it's easier if you're alone because you have less people to agree with. So it yeah. really depends on your partner, right? So yeah, um, there's nothing inherently problematic about any of those uh, ideas if your your partner agrees with it. Mm. That's it. Yeah. Well, I can see Small how person. it would. Sorry. Yeah, I would agree that that is much easier to do uh, do it alone. But I do think that Nico has some good insights on the counter. Right. So I was going to say that it would be conceivable that in vacuum it would be easier. Everything would be easier when you have less variables. So when you're alone, and that is true to some extent. But then when you factor in the longer term. After all, we are tribal animals. We we are family animals, and the, in my opinion, the a big important thing is to keep human race going. So that requires a family. That requires having children. So there is a higher meaning in that, in my opinion. And while it is uh, practically, in some ways, more difficult to be mobile with 
with your family, which you know I've been doing for years already. I don't consider it a problem at all. Uh, on the contrary, it's actually more rich that way because you get to share those experiences with the people you love. Mm -hmm. So that brings me to the second point. Like while there's practical difference, um, I would still say that it's better to travel in um, in a group. Like there's, I think it's an African proverb. Like if you want to travel fast, go alone. If you want to travel long uh, or far. Uh, then go together. So I think that's, you know, it's about your mindset. Like you can always find an excuse that, you know, it's too difficult. Your kids have school, friends, blah, blah, blah. You don't want to uproot them. In the end, those are all just excuses, stories that you tell yourself that you can or cannot do. And either in either case, you're correct. Um, you just make the decision for yourself. Though I would like to add that there is often harder to travel as a family than it is to travel as a community because of those social factors, you know, kids have friends, uh, your, your girl has friends, etc., etc. and you need dudes to, I mean, guys lead guys in their lives and girls lead girls in their lives, you know, so um, I, I think it's, it's often easier to operate as a community and not just as a family. Hmm. It has yeah. higher setup costs, but it, it is long term, it's much more stable, much more easy. You can outsource problems, um, you can cooperate on things, you know, childcare, education, etc., etc., etc. Every move means having to rebuild your social network. That's going to be exhausting really quickly. Yeah, I think they're like mutually com complementary. Like uh, a solo traveler can benefit from a partner. Uh, a partner can benefit from a bigger family, a family can benefit from uh, a group of families that can then service each other. So there's definitely value there. And then there's the freedom also to, you know, take your stuff and go if, if yeah. you don't like what's going on around you. And I think that's the key here because uh, yeah. the, the bigger the tribes grow, the more certain it is that there's kind of going to be some kind of a civil war after the dis disagreements escalate from being constructive into destructive uh, yeah. because uh, you know mob mentality and stuff like that so I, I think we're moving towards a society with much smaller tribes by because because you know the states are going to have to compete for the customers in my opinion once people have the control over their means of payment and the, uh, the wealth people want to have to vote and that's the start of the same old shit again. <laughs> I, I think when people learn to vote with their legs and their wallets, and once they realize that their wallets actually carry weight, uh, I think that's when we're going to see, like people do like to vote, you know, it's just that the voting we refer to now is largely meaningless. Yeah. What, one question also, I, I'm not sure if you guys mentioned it before, but what, what is this, what does a shipping container cost? How do you get one? Are there regulations involved in, you know, dealing with uh, buying a shipping container? Are there different sizes? A whole bunch of questions. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I think anybody can buy shipping containers. Like there's plenty of sizes. I think that regular size is 20 feet and then there's the 40 feet, which is the long one. And then there's the high cube model, which is, uh, especially good for constructing uh, because even for a regular size uh, person, the regular shipping container is kind of low, which can have benefits if you're really looking for something, something small and portable and efficient. But uh, the high cube model is is the one that you want. And in terms of price, I I haven't checked in a while. But back in the day when I was planning those projects, it was you can get like a used one for maybe a one one to two grand, even less than that if you are willing to work for it a little bit. I'm not sure how much the new ones are. Maybe Smuggler has better info. Yeah. So the price of your shipping container depends dramatically on where you buy it. So the closer you are to a port that has an overhang of shipping containers, the cheaper the shipping containers are. And uh, the further away you are from such a port, the, the more expensive they are. Um, so in like most of Germany, it's something like two and a half thousand for a single use uh, high cube 20 foot shipping container. But the price is very, very simple. You know, you go on the internet, there are traders for shipping containers. You basically order it like on Amazon and then deliver it. So it's really trivial. Um, I would always go for a 20 foot uh, shipping container. 
like for the half size fitting containers. They're universally shippable, but they're much more easy to handle. So placing them somewhere, transporting them on the truck, especially um, when you want to put it like in the middle of the wilderness or in the middle of, middle of the city, then 20 foot is much more flexible than 40 foot. It's just, and you can connect 20 foot containers as much as you want to. So there's no problem. And the other thing is, uh, you kind of have to get high cube. You should get a single travel uh, container. So um, basically, in most of the West, you cannot buy new shipping containers. They are always used. But you can uh, get shipping containers that have only have been used for shipping once. So uh, getting one uh, of those it really makes sense because they're higher quality. You have to to put less uh, money into, into fixing them, etc. And so for two and a half thousand euros, you have a 20 foot shipping container. And then the price of outfitting it really depends on how much work you put into that, how great you want to have it, etc. But um, for 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, you can have a, a completely outfitted system. So with everything. And if, Interesting. if you want to get if you want to get really off really easy, you can get one of those freezing uh, freezer sh shipping containers yes. because they are insulated uh, already. Uh, so you can you can just drop it somewhere, and then you're pretty yeah. much done if you if you're not picky with your interiors. Yeah. Mm. This was a really interesting topic, guys. Uh, but I think it's time to let Max. When is enough enough? The government taxes, licenses, and restricts almost everything we do, and then they have the balls to act like we are unable to handle freedom. In revoked consent, we see what happens when technology, anger, and desire for freedom come in contact with government. Alternate currencies, the Vanu lifestyle, and a strong security culture, these all make regular people targets. Are you ready to revoke consent? Find out how freedom can triumph over totalitarianism in this libertarian and Vanu themed piece of fiction, Revoked Consent, authored by TVP listener Ian Minnelli. To pick up your copy today, just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash revoked consent. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash revoked consent. And make sure to check out the rest of the books, audiobooks, and privacy products available from Liberty Under Attack Publications. Libertyunderattack.com. Share your story, find your freedom.